Hello everybody, my name is Gregory Chencha. Um, I'm working at Tohoku University in Japan and um, thank you for taking the time to visit my presentation. Um, I'm going to be talking to you all today about fuel cell vehicles in Japan and strategies taken to um, accelerate their production and their diffusion. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to shrink my video, just put it up into the top corner here and then invite you to um, sit back and hopefully uh, enjoy my presentation. So um, I'm gonna try and finish this um, within you know, a space of around 20 uh, minutes or so, as much as possible. So um, this is based on a paper that was just accepted only, um, just published just only last week um, in energy policy. And uh, this was done with my co-authors, um, Aras uh, Taiha and uh, Masaru Yarime. And um, if you don't have access, you can use this link here to obtain um, a free uh, a free link, uh, sorry, a free access to the um, journal if you um, don't have a subscription. So um, just to give you the background very briefly um, on the story here. So um, many scholars have, and policymakers also have been sort of drawing attention to the, to the idea that a battle has begun between electric vehicles and fuel cell vehicles. Um, now I'll call fuel cell vehicles to save words and time uh, FCVs from now on. So um, although these uh, technologies are not necessarily in direct competition, um, they um, can definitely complement each other by making up for the sort of weaknesses of each other. But um, battery electric vehicles, EVs, definitely have a head start in terms of um, diffusion. There are many more uh, models on the market. They're, um, they're much cheaper um, and the charging infrastructure is much more um, common. However, fuel cell vehicles, FCVs, can help spur road transport el electrification because they have longer driving ranges, which is really well suited for high utilization vehicles and heavy duty applications. They have a very fast um, refueling time. Uh, it's around three minutes. They can um, replace the existing gasoline infrastructure, and this is uh, very uh, useful because this allows the um, incumbents, sort of, you know, the oil companies, to maintain their role, active role, in this transition to electrification. And they can also help um, reduce uh, supply chain risks because um, cobalt and nickel are two sort of very important um, pressure or rare metals um, that are involved in making batteries. And so for these sort of advantages that um, fuel cell vehicles have, not forgetting that, you know, battery electric vehicles are probably going to still dominate the light duty um, transport sector electrification. Um, numerous countries, which I've listed here in Asia, USA and Europe, are actually pursuing um, the, uh, pursuing the um, adoption of both of these technologies. And so... Um, in terms of the gaps of knowledge uh, in literature, um, there are many papers that talk about all these hurdles that fuel cell vehicles, FCVs have. But there are very, very few studies that actually look at efforts, you know, governance efforts to overcome these, um, these problems. And so Japan is an excellent sort of um, case study to consider these, um, you know, coping strategies to overcome these well-known hurdles to FCV um, adoption. And that's because um, of the uh, three currently available commercially, commercially available FCVs in the world, um, two of the makers are based here in Japan, that's Toyota and Honda. And Japan has the second highest um, diffusion rate for um, vehicles. It's only 4,000, but still California has about 8,000. Um, so this is quite significant. But what's more significant is that um, uh, the government targets to increase the on-road vehicle numbers are um, quite ambitious going into the next you know, five, 10 years. So the government's aiming to have 40,000 on the road by the end of this financial year, um, 200,000 five, five, five years later, and then you know, in a decade's time, almost 1,800,000 vehicles. So um, the re research objective here is to examine the approaches, the outcomes, and the limitations of, of strategies, of governance strategies in Japan, that are used to accelerate the production and the diffusion of vehicles, fuel cell vehicles. So let's go into the background here. So before we talk about fuel cell vehicles, um, it's important to put all this in perspective and understand that in Japan, there's this idea of pursuing a um, hydrogen society. And what this basically is, is um, producing hydrogen in large quantities from lots of different um, energy sources and using it in lots of different um, areas in society. And um, the idea is that this is gonna take place over three stages. And um, Japan is right now focusing on this um, stage one here. And that's basically taking these existing technologies, the vehicles, the refueling stations, and uh, this is cogeneration technology that produces a, a little bit of power and also um, hot water heat. And um, the idea is to take these existing technologies and then to diffuse these as much as possible. 
And then while we're doing this, we're beginning research and development, and we're beginning um, large scale um, pilot projects, demonstration projects, to explore the idea of producing uh, hydrogen overseas from cheap um, energy sources and then importing that. And then the idea is to sort of then to achieve this going into the future. And then once we have these um, supply of uh, su you know, sustainable low cost hydrogen, to then start using that in very, very large quantities. And the idea is to move beyond the transport sector to also look at um, the power sector and also um, you know, ships, trains, um, airplanes, uses outside of road transport. So um, the idea of a hydrogen society kind of sounds like you know, some sort of um, far off sort of um, future, but actually many of the, of the components that we require to sort of you know, make progress towards here are actually existing and on the market today. And so you can walk around and see um, these uh, coal generation uh, fuel cell units, which take basically gas from the, the main gas pipeline, um, and they uh, convert that to hydrogen. And then the byproduct of this is heat. So then they produce a bit of, a bit of power because um, there's a small fuel cell in there that produces power. And then the heat that's produced there is then used to um, create hot water. So this is um, already available. And when we can sort of, you can find about 150 um, uh, hydrogen fueling stations in Japan. Here's one of the more sort of, you know, landmark sort of ones here in front of the, um, the Tokyo Tower in um, Tokyo. And then we also have fuel cell buses. You can actually go and take um, one of these buses. There's only a few dozen of these on the roads and they're all concentrated in Tokyo. But the fact of the matter is that they're there today. Very expensive, mind you. Um, so why is Japan pursuing a hydrogen society? Because, you know, many countries are not exactly, um, you know, putting massive public investments in pursuing this technology. Well, Japan has um, historically been a global leader in this field. It's, it's made very large um, investments. And um, the sales of these you know, technologies, especially the coal generation fuel cells that I mentioned before, and the patents that have been secured from all this um, R&D progress um, are, are leading the world. And so there's a widespread, widespread awareness that this technology has um, very important export opportunities. Now, Japan is an energy importer. We import uh, gas, oil, and also coal as well. But um, for the transportation sector, oil especially. So the idea is that we need to decarbonize this, these um, hydrocarbon uh, import chains, import supply chains. So hydrogen is a potential tool there to achieve that. And then we also have, um, I mean, the auto industry is the most um, important um, industry in Japan. We're home as, you know, to many household names around the world. Um, Toyota, Honda, um, Matsuda, uh, Suzuki, they're just many, many automobile automobile makers, automakers, and um, they're very aware of this sort of, you know, shift towards EVs around the world. And EVs are kind of a pretty easy to imitate technology, whereas fuel cell vehicles, FCVs, are, um, are much more complex and sort of, you know, the, the, the entry barriers to, um, the, the hurdles to entering the market for newcomers are much higher than it is for EVs. So, you know, this is FCVs also have a perspective where um, they can actually provide an international sort of competitive advantage to the Japanese automakers. This is not the only reason, but it's one of the um, important strategic reasons from an industrial policy perspective. And then there are very few opponents um, at the high sort of, you know, the so-called kind of regime level here in Japan. Basically, um, the fossil fuel regime is totally behind the idea of a hydrogen society. And that's why you have oil companies, gas companies um, behind this. And the idea is that this basically um, hydrogen is compatible with their existing business models where we, you know, large investments, large centralized projects, importing energy, distributing energy. This um, is what's going to happen with hydrogen. Of course, there's um, a, um, a decentralized aspect. We can produce hydrogen you know, in small quantities you know, in a distributed energy network, but the idea is that Japan's departing from this um, centralized network. So a, a centralized production approach. So um, the methods and the analytical framework. So um, what I did was in, I, I jumped out of this very narrow hydrogen world and I sort of looked first of all at barriers that were common both to electric vehicles and to fuel cell vehicles. And I identified these in the literature. And I condensed these into an analytical framework. And then I um, used these sort of barriers that are reported in literature as the starting point. And I said, well, what's Japan doing to overcome these, um, these barriers? What's Japan's coping strategies? And so to collect data for this, I did um, a whole bunch of interviews, almost 20 interviews with um, government um, agencies, automakers, uh, fuel supplies, and academic and um, independent experts. And I also conducted document analysis. And um, this research was all conducted in Japanese. I'm a Japanese speaker. Um, and yes, so um, basically the analytical framework, uh, I'm not gonna go into the details of this, but this was, um, a lot of it was obtained. The thinking of this was 
obtained from the idea of, you know, technological um, diffusion and, you know, what are the basic public policy approaches re required to accelerate this, to support this. And um, I looked at Steinmuller, who um, is um, at uh, University of Sussex. And um, I categorized the framework into he, the four categories that he proposes, basically the supply of the technology. So um, the governance challenge here is um, what can be done to lower the production costs of vehicles and to improve their technical performance. What sort of instruments and approaches can help auto manufacturers address these challenges. And then we have the infrastructure. Um, EVs require um, charging. Uh, fuel cell vehicles require hydrogen fueling stations. So how, do, how can we first of all secure a steady supply of either electricity or hydrogen for the vehicles? And then how can we um, accelerate the rollout of this infrastructure and then reduce you know, the, the operating, the construction, the operating costs and, there, and thereby reduce the investment risk. This is a two sort of um, very important uh, governance challenges here. And then we have the, dem the demand side, so the vehicle users. How, to, how can we simulate, um, sorry, stimulate uh, demand for vehicles despite you know, the, all these psychological barriers that we have in this you know, there's zero emissions um, vehicle market. You know, we have all these charging or fueling inconveniences. We have customers that, are lack, of, you know, that, that lack familiar familiarity with these technologies. These uh, technologies are more expensive relative to um, uh, internal combustion engines. So um, that's one set of challenges. And the other set of the challenges, you know, well, um, the car market is full of different vehicles. We have light duty for the mass market. We have, you know, commercial fleets, government fleets. We have um, heavy duty, you know, we have buses, we have trucks. You know, which market segment should we focus on when we're formulating our um, production and our adoption strategy? And then the idea is we have these cross-cutting kind of fourth category, these cross-cutting institutional challenges where we have to sort of, you know, optimize the entire innovation system. And so how can we stimulate investments and, you know, market activity in a large number of players in the market so as to increase the availability of knowledge and technology? So these are the government's challenges that I've focused on in the case of Japan. And in making this framework, uh, the idea is that these are just four general kind of universal categories. And obviously we can increase um, the specific challenges that relate to each of these four categories. But I've chosen, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was seven for Japan. And um, so I'm now gonna present very briefly the findings. So in terms of the um, supply side, the production issues, so um, how can we you know, lower production costs and increase technical performance? Um, Japan has taken um, a roadmap approach. So um, this is very common in you know, countries that are you know, working with hydrogen. The idea is that the government works with industry and sets these targets for you know, the government, for industry to aim towards. And so we have um, uh, targets that concern two levels. One is the cost of the components, and the other um, dimension is the technical performance, the specifications. And so the idea is that we want to increase the driving range of vehicles. Right now, you know, it's kind of like double kind of like the, the average electric vehicle, but the idea is we want to increase that even more for the future. We want to make fuel cells, so fuel cell stacks, FCs, we want to make them um, more powerful so we can make them smaller. And then if, when they're smaller, we can put them in more, more vehicles. And one of the big costs in fuel cells is platinum. So we want to reduce the amount of platinum um, going into the future. And then we also, by doing that, we want to um, reduce the cost of the product, the cost of um, producing the fuel, sacks, um, the fuel cell stack and the tank, the hydrogen fueling tank. The hydrogen fuel tank and so the idea is to um, reduce this dramatic, uh, drastically going into the future um, and so here are the targets here and so um, I can tell you right away that um, you know Toyota with their upcoming Mirai, Mirai um, for re due first uh, release at the end of this year looks like they're pretty much on schedule even ahead of schedule to hit some of these targets because the Mirai is reported to have a 30% increased driving range and a 50% decrease in the fuel cell system costs so um it looks like you know there's been some um, bit of progress here. Um, so the idea is that this um, technological progress, the you know the acceleration, the innovation, is going to be achieved via open innovation. And so the idea is that um, the two uh, FCV makers today, Toyota and Honda, openly share the problems that they're facing, um, problems that are facing you know in mass producing vehicles and you know looking I guess at the ongoing ongoing you know maintenance um, and also production issues. And then the government kind of looks at these issues. And the government sort of says, well, these issues are kind of engineering issues, sort them out yourself. And then we have these other issues that are kind of con concerning, you know, like how do we develop, um, you know, superior materials that don't, maybe don't exist today. This is a basic science question. And this deserves, you know, from the government's pers perspective, it deserves um, funding support. So the idea is that the government is, go is going to back, um, you know, this scientific research to sort of help some of, solve some of these fundamental issues that the, t that the vehicle makers perhaps can't solve by themselves. And so the idea is that these problems that these automakers um, are having 
are shared openly. And also the innovation, the results of these funding programs are also shared openly. So there's a bit of a focus on open innovation, or not a bit, there's a, there's a large focus on uh, open innovation. And the idea is that this is sort of a um, historical kind of um, shift away from close innovation, because in the vehicle industry in Japan, um, the companies have traditionally been reluctant to, sh uh, to share their technical um, research and development programs and also their challenges. And so our government funding agencies said, you know, Japanese vehicle manufacturers have historically developed technology behind closed doors in secrecy. But the idea is that there's very widespread awareness that because, you know, the fuel cell market's still at a very immature stage, it's still very fragile, um, you know, there's a chance that it could just be crushed in the light duty sector by battery vehicles. By battery electric vehicles, the idea is that open innovation is required. And so um, Toyota and Honda sort of have been sort of um, proactively working together, exchanging information. And the idea is that one of the vehicle manufacturers I interviewed sort of said that they've never really seen the two companies standing side by side, publicly sharing information before. So um, despite this, you know, kind of seemingly progress, seemingly tangible progress, um, the, there's only 4,000 fuel cell vehicles on the road today in Japan. And this is only makes up 10% of the um, target of 40,000 by the end of this financial year. And um, there seem to be several reasons for this delay. Um, and basically the main one is obviously there's um, a production problem. So um, the um, production volumes are not um, at the scale of the government targets. And so the reason is that um, fuel cell costs, fuel cell stacks and the tanks, um, it's very technically difficult to make and very expensive. And um, there's a lot of difficulty and time involved in setting up these production lines. So I guess the um, amount of time and the expense taken and the, the technical complexity of achieving these um, uh, increased volume of production is um, quite um, taking more time than a lot of stakeholders anticipated. So the infrastructure. So how do we su secure a, su um, a sustainable supply of cheap hydrogen? So Japan's approach, again, is to start off with a roadmap. And we have all these targets here sort of listed down the bottom here. And the idea is to produce, take this, you know, very small current production that we have today and to really increase this, to increase this, um, yeah, by several orders of magnitude. And then to really take this very expensive cost today of $10, uh, kilo, $10 US dollars per kilo and really drive this down in cost. And the, the, the idea is to do this, we have to produce huge amounts of hydrogen. So Japan's approach is shown at number 0.2 here is to go overseas and to produce hydrogen overseas and to import it. And the idea is to look at um, unexploited fossil, fuel fossil fuels, um, gas, and also uh, coal, brown coal, and then to um, use carbon capture and storage. So we're gonna you know, take coal, gasify that, um, convert that to hydrogen, capture the carbon, store it, and then um, bring this into Japan. And then the idea is that this same approach can be used once we've set up supply chains, we can produce hydrogen in different ways, for example, from renewables and also import it. So um, Japan is experimenting with different supply chains today. And then the idea is that to really achieve these cost targets, so these cost targets, you know, in the future of, you know, $2 um, per kilo, which would then basically, we could fill up a Mirai vehicle for, you know, for $10 US dollars, we can drive, you know, seven, 800 kilometers um, to achieve this. Basically, we have to produce a, a huge amount of hydrogen that we could never consume in the transport sector alone. So we have to look for another consumer of hydrogen outside the transport sector. And Japan's looking for the power sector, for power stations, um, gas power stations that burn gas. The idea is to start introducing hydrogen in small quantities and, and increasing those quantities into the future. And so Japan is looking at several supply chains. Um, and so the idea is to, um, you know, uh, this is a, an image from Kawasaki Heavy Industry who's making ships. And um, the idea is that this is, um, can e import um, liquefied hydrogen from you know, many countries. We can produce, in theory, hydrogen from hydropower in Quebec. Uh, you know, here in, in Canada, we can produce it uh, from, um, you know, wi from um, wind turbines in um, South America. But right now, one of the real focuses is on Australia, in Victoria, on brown coal, gasifying that and bringing that into in Japan. So, but you should understand that this is not the only approach. The idea is that this supply chain approach can be used to bring in hydrogen from many different countries and produce in many different ways. And so, um, as I said before, Japan's approach is really focusing on uh, brown coal in Australia and then um, bringing that by ship and then um, consuming that in the power sector, but also um, in the vehicle sector. Um, so this, um, the pilot uh, demonstration of this is um, a little bit interrupted, I guess, by the COVID-19 um, situation, but it's probably going to be um, 
probably in time for the Olympics next year. That would be my estimation. It's probably going to be perfectly timed for that, I would say, now that we're delayed because of the, um, the COVID situation. So um, the demand side. So how do we create um, consumer demand? So um, these vehicles are very expensive. We're looking at around you know, 65,000 US dollars. There's only a very small number out there. You have to order them you know, well in advance. How do you create demand for that? Japan's response has been through massive subsidies, national subsidies that basically pay, um, you know, probably, what is this? It's, it's almost, it's between 25 to 30% of the vehicle cost. And then on top of that, sub, uh, prefectures will give you another large, um, you know, 15% of the vehicle uh, cost. And the idea is that with these two subsidies combined, we're lowering the vehicle cost down to um, basically a hybrid vehicle cost. Then we have vehicle tax exemptions. And so when you combine, you're basically slashing the vehicle cost almost in half, basically down to around the cost of um, a hybrid vehicle. Now, um, that's one approach. And basically, it's the only approach, the financial um, incentives. Now, um, I should say that, you know, this very, we have still very limited vehicle production today. So that means that, you know, demand issues are still not a big issue yet. You know, you know there's, a, there's not a huge requirement to create societal demand just yet because we've only got, you know, a few thousand vehicles being supplied to the Japanese market each year. Um, but still, the demand strategies that have been used are entirely relying on subsidies. And subsidies, public subsidies, as you know, they're a short-term solution and they're a public burden. And so um, there's a little bit of concern about this in interviews. You know, um, one respondent argued that, you know, policy is driven by a mentality that assumes that simply making a good product is going to sell automatically. So the idea is that, you know, maybe we should be looking at other measures or at least thinking about this for the future. How can we create demand through other measures, not just financial measures, maybe, for example, regulation. Now, the demand side strategy. So um, we have, you know, the road transport sector. Um, who should we focus on in the early years? Should it be the light duty passenger sector? Should it be, you know, commercial vehicles like this kind of medium, medium duty truck here? Or should it be large trucks? Or should it be buses? So Japan is focused on the left. Japan's focused um, on the light duty passenger uh, sector. And this is the same as California, same as the United States. And um, that's because this is seen as optimal for driving um, economies of scale. Because um, the idea is if we can sell, produce and sell lots of these vehicles, the basic important components, the, um, the fuel cell stacks and also the, uh, the fuel tanks, if we can produce these in large volumes and cheaply, then we can drive down the costs of the expensive components that we require for um, other applications in the medium to heavy duty sector. And so that means the government um, fueling government diffusion targets and the fueling station locations are focusing on catering, catering to this um, light duty market. And we are trying to, um, Japan is um, offering subsidies, trying to you know, encourage um, bus fleets to buy buses and trying to encourage taxis to buy them, but there's very limited uptake. And one of the big barriers seems to be just the running costs are very high. Running costs are everything, as you know, for a commercial fleet. Um, you know, it's often said that you can give a commercial fleet a vehicle for free, but if that fuel is expensive, then it's just not really not worth it. And um, unfortunately, today, with you know, it costs about 50 US dollars to um, fill a tank of hydrogen. Um, this is far more expensive than um, a, a taxi that runs on compressed natural gas, um, and it's much more expensive than a battery vehicle. So um, there's we, there's a big need here to drive down the costs of fuel to create demand. Um, now there's other there's lots of other unresolved issues here. So battery performance is improving rapidly for battery electric vehicles. The driving range is um, increasing you know, every year and much faster than many of the FCV automakers thought would be the case several years ago. And so there's a market sentiment that um, the market in the light duty sector is shifting towards, has shifted towards EVs. And, um, but you know, that said, still with this you know, new um, generation of vehicles that are scheduled um, from Japan's makers, um, the driving range is going to increase extremely significantly. And also, um, don't forget that people that live like in rental properties, people that live in apartments, how, how they charge their vehicles is a big unresolved challenge. And when you have a huge number of um, charging requirements across society, this poses grid challenges. And so right now, um, I think it's probably still too early to write off um, fuel cell vehicle prospects in the light duty sector. Um, because they have lots of strengths in terms of being able to um, provide um, fueling needs in a very compressed um, amount of space. Um, so uh, Japan, because they're focusing on um, passenger vehicles, some expert interviews um, revealed a concern about this, um, arguing that, you know, especially from the perspective of a fueling station operator, then it would be much more attractive to have, you know, trucks, buses, taxi fleets coming in that driving all the time, they consume more fuel. 
Um, this is better for station economics, but um, as I said before, Japan's strategy is to focus on the light duty mass market. Um, so the next challenge we have is institutional, it's cross cutting. How do we mobilize you know, a large number of players in the market? You know, encourage competition, get other people to come into the market and produce fuel cell vehicles. Now Toyota um, have imitated Tesla. Tesla took an approach um, of opening up their patents. And to Toyota have done this, and they've done this for um, all their fuel stacks, for the hydrogen tanks, and for the fueling infrastructure. And um, I don't know specifically what patents have been opened. You know, maybe it's probably possible they haven't released the most valuable patents, but they've released, as it says here in this photograph, you know, almost 6,000. The idea was to um, lower the um, entry barriers for new market entrants. And um, the idea was to really try and um, diffuse um, a faster rollout of station, uh, of fueling stations. And um, unfortunately, no um, other new fuel cell vehicle maker has emerged. Um, only Toyota and Honda are making vehicles today. Nissan is the third Japanese maker that can make the vehicles, but they're not. Um, and even Honda's um, production is very limited. So um, there are, have been requests um, from the automotive industry to use these patents, but they're coming from overseas and they're coming from heavy duty makers, you know, bus companies, truck companies. And these seem to be from markets where regulation is driving a shift in production um, technological selection. So um, there's been no impact in terms of stimulating the FCV makers for Japan. Um, so fuel cell vehicles, the production is very expensive, it's very complex, and this seems to be um, hampering, again, these um, new entrants um, coming on into the industry. So um, just because of time, I'm gonna try and I guess, I have to really, because I've already hit 25 minutes and I'm sorry for taking so long. And um, if anyone has taken the time to listen to this presentation, wow, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so the last strategy I'm gonna quickly outline here is Japan's um, approach for building fueling stations. And so um, Japan is aiming for um, 160 by the end of this year and 320 by 2025. And so the idea is um, it's very difficult in the early years because um, there's not many vehicles on the road. So our fueling station is going to have low income. It's an investment risk and that's going to slow down the reluctance. That's going to slow down the appetite for industry to build these stations. So Japan's approach has been to um, build a private platform and to take the station builders, to take investors and to take um, government subsidies and to mix all this together. And um, the automakers are providing um, subsidies for this platform, in providing investments, and to give this money to the market, to the people that build um, fueling stations. And the people that build fueling stations build them, and then once they've built it, they give the um, ownership to this platform. And this platform then assumes all the operating risks and the investment risks. And they then give the station operator um, an income to operate the station. That way they can employ the staff, they can put their logo there, so it's still like on their portfolio but the investment risk has been transformed to this shared platform. So that's Japan's approach. And um, this is a 10 year strategy and this seems to be working quite well. And on top of this, there's um, fueling stations are very expensive um, relative to overseas. But one of the reasons for this is because um, Japanese stations are built from scratch. They're all um, greenfield projects. And so the idea is to um, um, try and reform a whole bunch of safety regulations make it easier to bring in like for example imported equipment make it you know cut down these maintenance costs that require you know certain thickness of uh, materials you know constant change over these material of these station components try and make this a bit easier on um, the station operators um, and then also to standardize the approach to building these stations because um especially in japan and california as well many of these stations are one of a kind because this is a new emerging technology so the idea is to say hey what should work what can work let's just go with that and to mass produce these and um so that's japan's approach um so lots of issues here you know station profitability is very low um there's only four thousand vehicles on the road today so um now vehicle manufacturers are not satisfied they want to have more stations but station operators want to have more vehicles so um, it's just your typical sort of catch-22 situation um, that hasn't been resolved right yet. But the idea is, is that we, we know that stations have to come first. So there's um, a widespread acceptance of this. So um, just to very briefly summarize this present, very long, I'm sorry, presentation. Um, so what I observed is very robust measures for supply side issues, how to cut down the costs and the, of fuel stack, fuel stack production, how to increase the technical um, performance, this is all happening, how to roll out the infrastructure, how to produce the hydrogen, how to bring it in at a low cost, there's measures here for this. And one of the implications here is if Japan succeeds in building international supply chains, this could really open up a whole era of global hydrogen trading. 
which would have you know positive consequences for other countries there's a big institutional challenge that's basically unresolved here how to increase the availability of fcv models and makers because as i've explained the uh, number of fuel cell ma vehicle makers in japan is still limited to um honda and toyota and so um there's this big problem where um fuel cells are very uh, high cost they're very risky they're very technically difficult so it's kind of difficult for um, newcomers to come into this market so this is an unresolved challenge and then we have this um idea that um we're probably going to have to try and create demand in the future without relying just on subsidies so um this can be done in several different ways um california has their interesting low carbon fuel standard um uh, regulation which um provides market incentives for um fueling stations to sell a low carbon fuel and hydrogen is a low high, low carbon fuel compared to gasoline so um this could be given an advantage in the marketplace um we also have another approach used in california and then export and china imported this approach is to um force vehicle manufacturers to produce a certain amount of um uh, either battery or fuel cell vehicles a certain force a certain production of um zero emission vehicles um but this will be difficult in japan um, because there's a historical government preference for voluntary targets. Um, there's a lot of sunk investments in the auto making industry with um, conventional internal combustion engines and hybrid and hybrid engines. And there's a lack of experience across the industry in the other makers, you know, that haven't made fuel cell vehicles before. So um, this is um, the end of the presentation. If you would like to um, learn more about Japan's hydrogen uh, strategy, then I invite you to quickly look at this little um, Google Drive I set up, which is a whole bunch of documents here that I've collected in English that um, I'm sure the authors would be very pleased if they knew that I was sharing them like this. So they're available for your use, for your reference. And also, um, here's my email address. And um, thank you very much. So this is just the end of my presentation. And I'm just going to stop it now. Once again, thank you very much for your, your attention.